Hello from the BBC World Service and welcome to the latest edition of the Documentary Podcast. Every week we bring you a range of stories from our presenters and reporters across the world. If you have the time, please rate the documentary on your podcast app and leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. In December 1918, a limited number of women in the United Kingdom voted for the first time in national parliamentary elections. And although it would be another ten years before all adult women were granted the right to vote in Britain, it did signal a major turning point in a campaign for universal suffrage which had begun in the middle of the 19th century. The struggle to be granted the vote had been a long and hard one in the UK, and the women who'd campaigned for change became known as the suffragettes. Because the doctor tortured me, you see, while he was, uh, when he was going to forcibly feed me. The policeman who was beginning to arrest her, I thought was very rough. So I <laughs> pummeled him, told him to let her go, and I was arrested again. Over the next hour, we're going to hear their story. It is totally untrue what all the cartoons made us out to be. One of the things that we were told was that we were not to look like cranks. In April of 1913, everybody was arrested, the whole staff, everyone at headquarters. I was protesting against the government, so that's why I selected the tower a place that was known all over the world, which was much better than a shop window. I'm Jane Garvey, and for the BBC World Service, this is The Lost World of the Suffragettes. Britain wasn't the first country in the world to grant women the vote. Canada, New Zealand, Finland, Norway, Australia and the Isle of Man, a tiny island off the coast of northwest England, all got there before the UK. There was a suffrage movement throughout the world from 1893. That was the, the first enfranchisement in New Zealand. Historian and author Jad Adams has studied the suffrage story globally. There were some uh, seven countries before the United Kingdom, and in that year, 1918, another seven countries enfranchised women. Bearing in mind then that countries like New Zealand and Australia achieved this decades before Great Britain, why is the suffragette campaign so significant? Almost every country had a suffrage movement and they would hold meetings and they'd distribute leaflets and they'd write books and none of them really caught the imagination in the way that the the suffragettes did. It's so very dramatic. However, it's important to recognise that In no other country was it necessary to have uh, a suffragette movement in which there was such violence, arson, use of explosives, slashing paintings in galleries, burning letters in letterboxes and so on. That strongly suggests that it wasn't really necessary in Britain either. Oxford University historian Professor Sir Brian Harrison conducted interviews as part of extensive research into the lives of the suffragettes in the 1970s. Sir Brian's tapes, nearly 200 in all, were donated to the Women's Library in London and are now stored at the London School of Economics. The extensive interviews paint an enlightening picture of what life was like for these people. Some of the women he met for his research were real characters and, though by that time very senior, could remember their lives as suffragettes very vividly. I think of uh, Maud Kate Smith. She was lying on a bed in a hospital and she talked to me about the extraordinary devices that the militant suffragists got up to in trying to coerce male politicians, including a scheme, for instance, for draining the whole of the British canal system through blowing up part of a canal near Birmingham. And she, even 50 years after the event, she could still recall exactly what happened and she would not reveal to me the names of any of the people who participated in it. She still held tightly to the secrecy of the militant uh, campaigning. They were to breach the canal and those two Puritans were there all night digging the hole in the side in the bank. The canal was up, you know, 
and it went off and it blew a bigger hole than ever, but it didn't pierce the basin of the canal. Mm. So, of course, the water didn't leak. <laughs> Leonora Cohen, for instance, a good example. I met her in 1974 when she was 102. And uh, she then went on later to talk about her, her deed, as she called it, breaking into the Crown Jewel case in the Tower of London. She described how terrified she was going round the circle line, getting out at Tower Hill, so terrified that she forgot to get out at Tower Hill and had to go all round again before she could get out. And the fear involved in not just doing the act itself but in breaking every convention for women of the time was uh, enormous. Have you ever been... Yes, I have been there. Yes, yes. well, you know then what I say is uh, difficult Mm. because there were two yeomen going around the central showcase and all the crowd and our instructions were never to hurt anybody if we could help it. We could then do what we liked with our own life but never injure anybody. And I, being tall, I had to weave in and out to get the place where I should be able to throw the missile over the heads of them. There was a terrible crash, a good aim. I don't know whether I've been a cricketer in the past life or not, but that's what happened. Leonora Cohen. The campaign for women to get the vote began in the 19th century. One family in particular grew impatient with the politicians' failure to deliver. The Pankhurst, led by Emmeline, supported by her daughters Christabel and Sylvia, formed the Women's Social and Political Union in October of 1903. Helen Pankhurst is Sylvia Pankhurst's granddaughter. So here in Manchester, in this house that we're sitting in now, the Pankhurst family reach a point where they decide that something else is required. This is after 50 years of campaigning, more than 16,000 petitions. Um, And as usual, possibly in this type of situation, there's a trigger. Richard Pankhurst had died, Emmeline's beloved husband, who had moulded a lot of the thinking within the family towards women's rights issues. And uh, there's a decision to raise some money for a hall in honour of him. And then they decide that this hall is going to be only for men. And on the back of so many other issues, this becomes a point at which they say, look, honestly, really? Is this, is this the world that we live in? And can't we do something about it? Can't we come together and say, OK, we just need to take action. We need to do more than has been done continuously without effect. Two years later, in 1905, their militant campaign was launched when Christabel and another leading figure, working-class suffragette Annie Kenny, disrupted a political meeting at the Free Trade Hall in Manchester. And the question is, when will government give women the vote? That's too long a question. So in the banners, it ends up being cut down to votes for women. And that becomes the rallying cry Uh, And over time, that turns into another rallying cry, which is deeds, not words. And that sense that what they're saying and asking of government is not just these platitudes, because they've had more than 50 years of campaigning, more than 16,000 petitions, many, many false promises. So what they're asking of government is deeds, actually, not just words, they're demanding change. They heckled, they stood on on their chairs, Annie Kenny unfurled a banner, they were manhandle that out and as far as the stewards were concerned that was the end of it and then when they were outside they continued to make a disturbance and in order to ensure that she was arrested uh, Christabel who had studied law made a technical assault on a policeman she struck him on the face and she spat on him the policeman wasn't injured but it was impossible for someone in a position of authority not to arrest her so uh, what happened to her then done that she was Taken to a police cell, then to magistrate's court, and got a sentence of a few days, a week in prison. On the 13th of October, 
1905. I was at a dinner party. Suffragette Grace Rowe. And at the dinner party, I suddenly announced that I believed there were women all over the United Kingdom who believed in the enfranchisement of women. They'd only got to get together. And the next day, the place was in pandemonium. The canary bird was shrieking. My aunt was saying, Harry, will you sort of break a blood vessel if you've gone the way you're going? Put back the hands of the clock 50 years. And I said, well, what's happened? he got the Daily Mail. And uh, it said that uh, Annie and Christopher were being thrown out of the Free Trade Hall in in uh, Manchester, and uh, I was terrifically excited about it. Christabel, I was determined I'd never stop when I got in touch with her. Men got the vote not by persuading, but by alarming the legislator. The present liberal government professed to believe in democratic government, yet they refused to carry out their principles in the case of women. They must be compelled by a united and determined women's movement to do justice in this matter. When I first went to Manchester to join the repertory company there, I met Louise Casson. Renowned actress Dame Sybil Thorndike. One of the first things she said to me was, what are you doing about the women's suffrage movement? I said, I didn't know anything about it. And he had it off through the floor. And he said, you mean to say you haven't heard Mrs. Pankhurst? I said, no, I don't know anything about her. You come this afternoon and hear her with me. And he took me over to the free trade hall, and I was completely bouleversed, completely overcome by her. She was wonderful. And in a week's time, I was taking the chair to meeting. A Liberal Party landslide in the general election of 1906 saw a vast swathe of social reforms, which would lay the foundations of what would eventually become Britain's welfare state. And suffrage campaigners were hopeful the Liberal victory would also mean an extension of the franchise to include votes for women. It was absolutely something that was, that was on the cards. The thing was that the government was saying what really matters to us is labour relations, old age pensions, national insurance. They simply didn't count women very highly on the list because they felt they were doing things paternalistically and benignly as well as they possibly could for the nation um, and really women agitating for the vote was something of a distraction as far as they were concerned. It was a bit of a nuisance really. And they weren't the backbone of the nation, so they didn't really need the vote. That was how they might have thought. It was felt that women couldn't actually contribute a great deal, and it was feared that women would simply vote the way their husbands or their fathers told them to. Defining the movement, I think, is not just a single moment of militancy or even a gradual moment of militancy. Helen Pankhurst again. There are waves within that whole suffragette timeline of times when they're more or less militant, depending on how they respond to the situation. And underlying all of this, I think, a, a constant echo is disappointment after disappointment, promises, false hopes, and then it goes back. Yeah, so I'm looking here at a chronology of some of the key dates, and it's interesting just to chart that uh, in 1907... The first Women's Parliament is in February at Caxton Hall in London, um, and there 60 women are arrested at a demonstration at the House of Commons. Sundry other events, but let's take one in 1908, where two suffragettes chain themselves to the railings at Number 10 Downing Street, and five women are arrested. That, that is the first time that happens. And one of the things that defines the suffragettes, actually, is individual women trying something out. Because if your room for manoeuvre is completely quashed... You, what happens is people think of new ways of doing it, new spaces to occupy, new ways of asking that question. And individual women identify once and they try something out and then it becomes something that the wider movement takes up. And I bought a guide to London and I sat in the park and I went through all the places of amusements and art galleries, everything, till I came to the Tees, Tower of London, that's it. I'd never been to the Tower and I knew nothing about it. I told Mrs Morris what had decided to go. Oh, she nearly went crazy. She said, there are police there. You'll be known to the police by now. You won't have a chance. And I said, I shall want some help. She said, what will you do? Huh. She said, you won't do anything because you'll be arrested before you've got in pretty well. So I thought, well, I'll take a chance. 
you were brave enough to, to go into the Tower of London and, and, and throw something at the Crown Jewels uh, case, mm. and yet you weren't brave enough to break a shop window in Bond Street. I don't understand. Quite. Well, I, was, I think, I don't know, I had a vivid picture of it all. You thought it would make more impact going to the Tower? Or well, I, what I thought was I was protesting against the government. I never thought about anything else. Where would I get a message home to the go government? Not in a shop window. Yes. So that's why I selected the tower. Mm. A place that was known all over the world. Mm. And what was more, I wasn't hurting anybody or any business. Leonora Cohen was awarded the OBE in 1928. She died at the age of 105 in 1978. They went right down from the Marble Lodge to Tottenham Court Road, and then bang went all the windows. Mrs Victoria Lydiard. In March of 1912, she travelled to London to take part in the WSPU window-smashing demonstration. We were doing Whitehall. Well, Whitehall was practically packed with uh, policemen, uh, each end, and they wouldn't let anybody go through. Well, they let me through. I, that's what I looked like, you see. Oh, yes, yes, marvellous. Quite innocent. <laughs> <laughs> With your hair all up, yes. <laughs> uh, I went and stood right near a policeman, and I threw one stone through more of his window, or smashed it. Well, the policeman next to me looked at me. He, he couldn't believe that I'd done it. Historian Elizabeth Crawford. Five o'clock in the evening, as the light uh, was disappearing, women stood in front of uh, plate glass windows in shops and offices and government offices and business premises in the streets of the West End of London and Oxford Street and uh, simultaneously, virtually, took hammers from their muffs or stones from their pockets and smashed these windows and there was great confusion. They didn't try to run away, they were arrested immediately. And, you know, it was very funny because afterwards the businessmen and shops complained the other side of the road that their windows had been smashed and all the crowd was on the left. <laughs> <laughs> the police and other authorities in the UK would often use force to stop the women campaigning. Well, I remember that at that time a lot of the suffragettes had been kicked very badly. A By lady, police. Constance Lytton, you know, died of cancer because she yes. was kicked in the stomach. Yes. Diane Atkinson is a suffrage historian. The police weren't really used to handling groups of women in this kind of way, in such numbers, with such fervour and conviction. And we need to get across that some of those processions, there were thousands of people. Well, yes, I mean, the, the, the processions um, across London to Hyde Park were, were, were sort of thousands of people who were tagging along uh, as well as being suffragettes. Uh, the park was filled with curious onlookers, really, not all supporters by mm. any means. But when women were going through Parliament Square to try and get into Parliament, that might be two or three hundred women. And they were, police at first were at a loss as to how to handle these situations. And they weren't very good at it. Miss Nora Balls, born into a middle-class family in the northeast of England in 1886, got involved with the Newcastle branch of the Women's Social and Political Union. She was arrested on three occasions after taking part in WSPU protests. I was walking next to a woman from Newcastle, a Mrs Brown, who was a very delicate, highly strong person. And the policeman who was beginning to arrest her I thought was very rough. So I <laughs> pummeled him, told him to let her go, and I was arrested again. But this time I was charged with assaulting the police. Black Friday is a special case. What happened there? Black Friday was when policemen had been drafted in from the east end of London to work in plain clothes. What year was this? This is 1910. And they are called in to support the mounted police and the uniformed constables and to be part of this whole strategy to deter women from going and doing that kind of activity again. So these are men who are in disguise. Mm -hmm. They're wearing irregular clothes. They're tough policemen. They used to East End kind of quite violent. Thuggery. Yeah. Uh, thugs, basically. And 
<laughs> they are wear- so cynically, they are wearing badges which say the Men's League for Women's Suffrage. So they're pretending to be supporters and they're right in the thick of all these stories of physical assault and sexual assault too. The suffragettes' militant activities, the, the slashing of, of paintings, the attacks on mailboxes and arson. Elizabeth, let, let's hear some names. Who, who was out there smashing windows and, and doing everything else? Well, more Kate Smith actually uh, slashed a, a painting by Sir George Clausen, uh, it was called Primavera, in the summer exhibition, the Royal Academy. And then there was Olive Bartels, who was a paid organiser for the WSPU. She'd been told, and it's quite cynical really, she shouldn't do anything that would go to prison because that would be a waste of her <laughs> skills. Yes. But she got at least one other woman to set fire to um, a building in uh, Cambridge. Buildings were all nice big houses there, but they were empty. They hadn't been occupied yet, and I thought, well, well, that's the place to try and burn. No danger of life, you see. We were never allowed to hurt anybody. That's one of the strictest rules. No, no, no human being was to be hurt. Well, I planned it all, and a young teacher said she would set fire. I got all the paraffin and all the stuff and got it all arranged and everything was done. That poor unfortunate teacher, she, she'd set fire. There was a terrific place. She had a gold watch and she le- dropped it and left it there so she was caught and put in prison. Maud Kate Smith again. As a rule, we were expected to get away if we could. If you're firing a pillar box, for instance, you can go uh, quite alone and drop in one letter, you know, over the um, explosive. Did you ever do that? Oh, sir? yes, over and over and over and over again. And, oh, it it made me so ill because I hated doing it. You can imagine, that's it, destroying a private letter. It rends your inside. But if if it's your job, it's your job, you see. I never turn back. Didn't you think it was perhaps a wrong thing to do? I'm a wrong tactic. Yes, of course. Half my mind was broken-hearted to have to do doing such a thing and the other had to go on and these people were my leaders and certainly I couldn't have had better they did lead us in the right way as far as they could no one was to be hurt didn't you ever think the leaders were wrong never never or they were too clever coming up in the lost world of the suffragettes well I mean it's not true that they didn't or mightn't have hurt anybody Lord Harcourt's house was set on fire with his four children in it. I mean, I think they were quite reckless about life and living. He got something very, very hard, forced it up my nostrils, and disarranged it. And it still bleeds now and again. That's after 60 years. Plus, we hear how music and song were used in the campaign for the vote. We used to have a procession with our banners, and if it was night time, we'd have lanterns, and we'd sing to our colleagues that was inside the prison. The documentary is just one of our BBC World Service podcasts. There are many others to choose from. When you've finished listening to this edition, why not try People Fixing the World with brilliant solutions to the world's problems? Looking at an unusual approach to help those with anxiety. Now, that's something that a lot of people suffer from. 60 million people in the European Union, that's about 8% of the population, are estimated to be affected by anxiety disorders. People who do seek medical help might have therapy or be prescribed medication. Or, if you're in Canada, you might try something a little different. And to listen to People Fixing the World, just search for it wherever you access your podcasts. Now, let's return to the documentary. A hundred years ago this year, some women in the United Kingdom won the right to vote after a bitter struggle which had gone on for decades. I'm Jane Garvey, and you're listening to The Lost World of the Suffragettes from the BBC World Service. Like any major movement, things aren't always what they seem on the surface, and the women's suffrage movement was rife with splits and disagreements, particularly over tactics. What about militancy, actually, Mrs Coleman? Did you, did you never get tempted? No, never. Yeah. I just thought it was stupid. But uh, there, there was this rather dramatic uh, preparedness for suffering that the militants had that must have been rather inspiring in a way. Yes, mm. there's no doubt, and uh, they were 
great, courageous women, most of them, but I just didn't approve of their methods. I would like, from you both, the ABC guide to the difference between the suffragists and the suffragettes. So, Elizabeth. Well, the suffragists had been campaigning since 1866 in a non-militant manner, using all the political means at uh, their disposal. And uh, they carried on in that way into the 20th century, even after the suffragettes sprang into life. Now, that was a name given them by a newspaper who didn't like them very much. Indeed, but they quickly adopted it for themselves with pride. Diane, did the suffragettes appear because the suffragists, frankly, hadn't made a great deal of progress? Yes. Mrs Pankhurst had been a suffragist herself. She'd been part of that uh, polite strategy, but then it dawned on her for a number of reasons that this was not working. So when she founded the organisation that would really be felt to be the noisy, shouty upstarts and kind of crashed into the scene from the wings. Their view and their style was deeds, not words. So she says, enough talk, we're going to make this happen with action. I think, in fact, we can hear the voice now of a suffragette, Maud Kate Smith, who actually just felt that the suffragists were pretty ineffectual. The thing was an absolute flop. They never accomplished anything. I mind you, I give them credit for trying, and I give them credit for trying to be gentle and kind, but it was a complete failure. Women would actually uh, swap between organisations. They'd be a member, say, of the NUWSS for a while, then see the attraction of the WSPU and join them, but then get a bit worried about the increasing militancy and go and back. Go back. Can you name some names? Who, who, which women did do that? Helen Moyes became uh, increasingly disillusioned, in fact, felt she was being edged out. My debate with Mrs Pankers, she came to Glasgow to tell me they were going to be militant, use force, throw stones, etc. I was horrified. I saw no value or use in militancy in a cause. I told her that and said, you use argument and reason in a cause... She would not argue about it, just went on saying it was necessary. So I said to Mrs. Pankers, I will resign, and did so in a letter to headquarters. Helen felt squeezed out and she resigned, but was immediately picked up by the NUWSS to become a paid organiser for them. We were interested in getting women as members and winning political support from members of parliament. The WSPU were not converting only. They attacked and harried cabinet ministers, getting their members to use violence and go to prison. Well, of course, all the votes in the world aren't worth one burnt baby. We all felt that. They loyally continued to do it, but it was tending to become a quite different organisation. There would have been some very big changes if it had gone on another six months. At its height, the suffragettes' campaign in Britain involved women chaining themselves to railings outside 10 Downing Street, smashing windows, blowing up mailboxes and planting bombs in property belonging to leading politicians. A few years ago, evidence even emerged of a plot in 1909 to assassinate the then Prime Minister Henry Asquith. The documents are kept in the UK National Archive at Kew in London. Uh, So this is a Home Office document um, and it's all about uh, pickets that are outside... That's Katie Fox, who's a modern domestic record specialist at Britain's National Archive. This particular document is from September 1909 and what had happened was a lady called Mrs Moore had handed a letter to the police which showed that some women were planning to potentially shoot Herbert Asquith. Mrs Moore was a member of the Women's Freedom League, which was a suffrage society. Whilst it was militant, it didn't necessarily condone acts of property destruction and arson. Um, And there's another bit of um, the document here that said the police had made inquiries at a particular shooting range and the proprietor had informed him that um, about three weeks before this, two women had said that they were suffragettes and had been practising with a browning pistol. 
Speaking in the late 1960s, Violet Bonham Carter, Asquith's daughter, recalled several occasions when women attacked her father. I remember quite well once we were peacefully playing golf together on the links at Lossiemouth, and I suddenly looked up and saw my father being savaged by two women who looked quite maniacal. They were trying to tear his clothes off. He was standing four square on the putting green, holding on to the lapels of his coat like grim death. But, I mean, that kind of situation was constantly arising. I mean, when I'm driving through the streets of Dublin, which I did after a big home rule demonstration with um, John Redmond and my father, an axe was flung out of the crowd at these two men, at my father, of course, and it just missed him by a hair's breadth, but it cut Redmond across his face and him, and he bled like anything. I mean, I think they were quite reckless about life and limb. The suffragettes increasingly are celebrated, and many, many people would absolutely agree that they should be. But, and you can debate this as long as you like, what they were doing was terrorism, and they did come close to killing people. They tried as hard as they could to avoid any loss of life. Historian and author Jad Adams... But arson, of course, is considered to be an outrageous act. Fire is so unpredictable, you simply can't be sure whether or not you're going to kill someone. And also, as soon as you've set a fire, the firefighters are going to have to go in there and put it out, and then you put them in danger. So it was possible that they were going to kill someone. When suffragettes did things like damaging golf courses or slashing paintings or something, the people around them were outraged by it. Did they actually delay women getting the vote? Uh, certainly some people were excited by the suffragettes and thought, yes, because they're making all these sacrifices, if someone is prepared to sacrifice their life by throwing themselves under a racehorse... Which is what then, Emily Wilding well, Davison did, yes. yes. If someone is prepared to do that, then their cause must be a just one. It's possible that the Irish politicians were turned off by the militancy and that the Irish politicians' vote actually swung the debate when there was a debate in, I think, 1912 in Parliament. And the reason why the Irish changed their minds was because Asquith was so much against women's suffrage and they thought they don't want to overturn Asquith on a matter he actually cares about and he's declared himself on. So let's just vote with Asquith because Asquith is going to give us home rule in Ireland. And that's what really mattered to them. So they were looking at the main goal and everything else could go by the wayside. Women would often be arrested and imprisoned after being caught engaging in militant tactics. Uh, the uh, magistrate didn't give us any time to speak. And uh, do we guilty? No, we're not guilty. Two months hard labour and one after the other, just like... That I, the only thing I remember of that day is being sentenced and then in the evening arriving at Holloway and I was put down in a cell which had uh, iron bars instead of a door and the window was right up high and I remember the wardress saying I'm sorry to have to put you here tonight but you will be moved in the morning but we're rather full up <laughs> you see it gradually got more serious, and then they started hunger striking, see. We were never out of our cells, and we were never allowed to be together. Inside prison, women would be force-fed. Maud Kate Smith spent several months in Winston Green Prison in Birmingham. Because the doctor tortured me, you see, when he was going to forcibly feed me. He got something very, very hard, forced it up my nostrils, and injured the... Um... Membrane? Yes, that sort of thing. And it still bleeds now and again. Does it really? Yes, mm. that's after 60 years. The tube is forced up your nostrils, if it'll go. It, it, I wasn't hurt that, that way because I, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't go after it injured that nostril. I had it put down the throat. And... The tube goes to a tun dish into which they pour the food. And the fiends, they, they pour food in there that hasn't been softened, you know, and been properly cooked or anything. That's anguish. It's such intense pain that it picked me up once and threw me across the cell. 
the long term impact on their mental and physical health. What do we know about that? Well, physically, I think a number of them had problems with speaking. Historian and biographer Diane Atkinson. Damage to the vocal cords as the the tubes are forced down. Um, one suffragette, her singing voice was impaired, certainly. Uh, when food got into the lungs, that could cause pleurisy and pneumonia. And at a time when there were antibiotics to deal with these conditions. And of course you don't get well, you know, from forcible feeding afterwards ever. What what happens? Colitis, um... You get colitis after the first fortnight's feeding. Well, that's when they're feeding you to try and keep you well, when they're kind, you know, it's an ordinary patient. They feed you gently, even then. They can't forcibly feed you for a fortnight without you getting colitis. Mm. And you have that for the rest of your life. The government worried a suffragette death may lead to martyrdom and so frustrated ministers introduced the so-called Cat and Mouse Act. This parliament that couldn't give women the votes could very quickly uh, enact a new act. Helen Pankhurst. And the real fear was that Emmeline would die and that that would become a martyr that the whole society couldn't deal with and the government would be forever remembered for that act. So they rush past the Cat and Mouse Act, which allows them to release women as they become really weak from the uh, hunger striking. So they don't have to force feed. They release them. The women start getting better. They start recuperating. And then they can still be arrested again and again. The uh, women are the mice that are being played about with by this cat that can just take them up, pick them up whenever they want to. Obviously, the Pankhurst were, were leading. Emmeline Pankhurst was the leader. How many times did she go to prison? Well, she was in and out of prison many times because, for example, in 1912, she was convicted for conspiracy to incite violence. She goes to prison. She goes on hunger strike. She's never, ever forced they don't. Dead. They don't go near her. They can't go that far because it would just be political dynamite and massive political capital for the suffragettes. So she's in and out of prison. She's arrested and re-arrested a number of times. So she has many visits to prison and many releases and many re-arrests. That's interesting. So she can't be accused of, of saying one thing and doing another. She was living the life oh, yes. she expected her followers to. Absolutely. OK. Absolutely. Unlike Christabel. Unlike Christabel. Well, tell me, did she not... Well, Christabel, this time, uh, from March 1912, she was living in Paris. And sometimes when I give illustrated talks, I have uh, two images that I put together. There's Christabel in a lovely flowing sort of royal dress in a garden in Paris, sitting in a deck chair. And then there's a picture of a uh, uh, suffragette taken in Holloway at um, the same time. same time, looking absolutely gaunt and haggard. And, and I think so we actually can hear one of the suffragettes talking about this in the archive from the 70s. I said to her, you know, I said to Christopher, I think this is probably one of the hardest things you've ever been asked to do, to come over here and be comfortable and situated as you are while your mother is hunger striking. Suffragette Marie Lawson. I said, it must be a dreadful strain upon you. She said, nobody asked me to do this. I decided to do it. It was my decision to do this. Did you feel she was wrong, really, to do that? I mean, did you think she ought to have gone to prison? Uh, well, I, I don't know. I think if you're going to incite people to go to prison, you ought to be willing to go yourself. Whilst some women disagreed over the tactics deployed to achieve the vote, there was also a group who actively campaigned against women getting the vote at all, as Julia Bush, author of Women Against the Vote, explains. Well, I think it would be true to say that there were probably more women who didn't want the vote than women who actively did want the vote, right up to the moment when women were actually given the vote. But I think what's important to understand is that some women were actively opposed to voting and they organised themselves into leagues against voting. Gertrude Bell, one of the um, leading archaeologists and later a spy during the First World War and, and one of the founders of modern Iraq, uh, she was an amazing woman traveller and she was also active in the Anti-Suffrage League. Uh, but the vast majority of women were simply indifferent. Born in 1896, Edith Florence Mitchell Sauerbutz was a schoolgirl in Haringey in London when the suffragette campaign first emerged. Her mother, Martha, worked as a stenographer and was a suffragist. She recalls how young working men of the period would react to the suffragettes' actions. They heard the 
in the street in Westminster, votes women, they go to the window and laugh their heads off. Silly lot of women. And then when they did something that was a nuisance, like smashing windows, and they were cross with them, but they still didn't take them seriously. They thought they were just a nuisance. Uh, I think that the day that Emily Davison, you know, went under a horse at the Derby, I'm quite certain that both my parents were more interested in the horse than Emily Davison. Did your parents actually argue about woman suffrage much at oh, all? Oh, no. Because no. you said your father laughed a lot, he thought it was yeah. highly ridiculous. Oh, dear, 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 these silly women, they're at it again, this sort of thing. But your your mother agreed with them, so didn't they have arguments no. about it somehow? Oh, no. I mean, no. <laughs> the, the, the idea mm. that women should have a vote and they'd mm. got a wife who was um, the main breadwinner. And yet he thought it was funny that women should want to vote. This was the masculine attitude at the time. Mm. Women who campaigned for the vote were often depicted in cartoons in the British newspapers of the day. Now, I'm sitting down with Elizabeth Crawford, the historian, and uh, Elizabeth has a collection, what, of, of cartoons actually in postcard form. Were yeah. they always like this? These were commercially um, uh, produced uh, postcards. They're a vast range of um, these uh, comic cartoons um, making uh, fun of the suffragettes. And boy, do they make fun of the suffragettes. Um, I'm looking at one now. Just describe this. This is a depiction of a meeting. Uh, There are a couple of posters on the wall. One says, Husbands for Old Maids, Down with Man. Um, And the caption at the bottom of the card is, At the suffragette meetings, you can hear some plain things and see them too. And sure enough, this meeting of very red-faced individuals is being addressed by a boot-faced woman with snaggle teeth and um, a rather austere um, hairstyle and facial expression. <laughs> it's pretty brutal, actually. It is, and the, the audience is uh, very much of the same type. They certainly concentrate on large red noses and big teeth yes. and hats. And glasses. And glasses. Pretty much like me, actually, to be honest. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's turn the pages. What have we got here? Now, this is an interesting one. When Women Vote, Washing Day, it's entitled, and there's a, a trio of women um, sitting at a table. They appear to be playing cards, eating chocolates, and in the background there's a poor man who's washing a baby. Um, <laughs> obviously the fear being that one once women got any kind of say over political life, they would abandon their domestic duties. Yes, and leave it to the poor men. Shocking. Yes. Let's actually listen to one of the suffragettes. This is Sybil Morrison talking about cartoons. Yeah. It, it is a totally untrue what the, all the cartoons made us out to be. One of the things that we were told was that we were not to look like cranks. We were not to dress like men with collars and ties and tweed suits and elastic-sided boots. It's really quite untrue, and yet all the cartoons of the, of the time tended to make us all look like... Um, as though we were imitating the, the male yeah. sex. You actually were told that when oh, you yes. joined, were you? Oh, yes, That's yes. Not, not, not to behave like cranks. Not to give any opportunity to anybody to say that we were. That is very interesting and very significant. <laughs> so the rule was, look normal. <laughs> Yes. And uh, look as feminine as possible, really, yes, um, to uh, diffuse uh, any uh, possibility of, of attacks. So why were some women eventually allowed to vote? What persuaded the political establishment to vote through change in early 1918? There were several factors, but it's widely believed the war helped. On the outbreak of war... Leading suffragettes called a ceasefire in their campaign, and soon politicians like David Lloyd George were engaging them in the recruitment of troops and work in the munitions factories. The Pankhurst relationship, or Emmeline's relationship with Lloyd George, was such that she was trusted with a mission during the First World War. Tell me a bit more about that. She went to Bosco to really to shore up the Russian side. Jad Adams again. And to uh, give support to the Russians. To keep so them in worked. the First World yes, War. To, which was, of course, a, a, a real challenge because the, the country was falling apart with a revolution yeah. with which she didn't have any great sympathy. The outbreak of World War I created a huge split in the suffragette movement in Britain. Emmeline and Christabel Pankhurst decided to stop all campaigning and to support the war effort. But Sylvia Pankhurst objected to this and carried on the battle leading the East London Federation of Suffragettes. We ought all to have loved each other, and most of us did. 
but some women I could not like. And when war broke out, it turned out they were all militarists. That was where the split came, finally. And you were a pacifist, were you? Oh, yes. But you see, now I believed in arbitration, but I felt exactly the same as Mrs. Pankhurst. Well, what is the good of fighting for a vote if you haven't got a country to vote in? Lloyd George, of course, was in the hot seat, and he was Minister of Munitions, and when he got called in, it was really marvellous that this approach was made to Mrs. Pankhurst, and the two were linked together. It wasn't an easy thing, but they were. Lloyd George, as a radical liberal, was particularly concerned that working women should have a vote. And so that put him to some extent at variance with the suffragists and the suffragettes, who, despite their differences in approach, both were asking for the same thing. They were both asking for women to get the vote as men have it. And the men who had the vote were rich men. They were were men with property. Now, we know that the suffrage movement used art and music to convey that very important message of theirs. Marches and processions in particular were really carefully choreographed. We used to have a procession from Bow. We used to march from Bow. We must have marched all the way to Holloway. I don't remember us getting on buses or anything like that. I can't remember. But anyway, with our banners, and if it was night time, we'd have lanterns. And if it was during the day, we'd have sprays of flowers and we'd march along and we'd sing to our colleagues that was inside the prison. I'm joined by the researcher Naomi Paxton and the singer-songwriter Claire Mooney. Naomi, you're still performing some of these songs today, aren't you? Yes, yes, as part of kind of bringing, trying to bring uh, some of the suffrage stories to life through theatre and, and music. And you have come with a ukulele. My suffragette ukulele. Oh, not just any ukulele. No, no, Winifred. <laughs> Naomi yeah. is now going to perform. What is this exactly? So this is a poem called Woman This and Woman That, which Lawrence Houseman wrote. It was published oh, in 1910. <laughs> uh, let's hear it. OK. We went before a magistrate who would not hear us speak To a drunken brute who beat his wife he only gave a week But we were sent to Holloway a calendar month or more Because we dared against his will to knock at Asquith's door For it's woman this and woman that and woman wait outside But it's listen to the ladies when it suits your party's side When it suits your party's side, my friends, when MPs on the stump And shaking in their shoes at how the cat is going to jump You talk of sanitation and temperance and schools And you send your male inspectors to impose your man-made rules The woman spheres the home, you say, then prove it to our face Give us the vote that we may make the home a happier place For it's woman this and woman that and woman say your say But it's what's the woman up to when she tries to show the way When she tries to show the way, my friend, she tries to show the way And the woman means to show it, that is why she's out today uh, well, the cell that I was in, the windows were high up. Well, I used to uh, stand on the back of the chair and look out of the window and I used to sing at the top of my voice <laughs> and nobody ever stopped me. Claire, you, you write and perform your own stuff, but I know you've got a real affection for, for these songs, haven't you? I have. Uh, the March of the Women, written by Ethel Smythe, um, is particularly a good one. Cause How does that go? It goes a bit like this. Shout! Shout up with your song, cry with the wind, for the dawn is breaking. March, march, swing you along, white blows our banner and hope is waking. Song with its story, dreams with their glory, lo they call and glad is the word forward. Oh, how it swells, thunder of freedom and voice of the Lord. It it was a sight to see everybody dressed in white with uh, sashes and belts of purple, white and green and little badges on and everything else. I seem to get all the paraphernalia from somewhere. I think we need something rousing now, so I'm going to ask Claire and Naomi to perform together and Elizabeth and I will... We'll hum along supportively in a sisterly fashion. Right, away you go. We stormed the House of Commons with our little band so true. We frightened all the ministers who trembled through and through. We're still uh, working for equality. Mm. Well, equality of opportunity, now. anyway. Yeah. I just don't happen to believe you can legislate for human behaviour. I'm sure it'll just be a cause for seeing how you can get round it. 
It's, it's so terribly difficult. Equal pay for work of equal value. How do you ever do that? The 1918 victory was not the end of the fight. It was another 10 years before women would finally get the vote on equal terms with men in Great Britain. And the cause goes marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, You've been listening to The Lost World of the Suffragettes with me, Jane Garvey. It was a Made in Manchester production for the BBC World Service. Thank you for listening. There will be more from the documentary podcast soon. If you haven't already, please do subscribe. And don't forget, do try our other BBC World Service podcasts too.